90 Days to Transformation Through the New Testament in 90 Days. So this week, we'll be talking about our identity in Christ. This is week seven, and we'll be reading Romans 10 through 1 Corinthians 16. The title of this lesson is The Church's Position, The Believer's Identity in Christ. Teaching goals for this week is number one, explain how we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. Two, provide an overview of 1 Corinthians. And three, explain the connection between the gospel and the resurrection of the dead. So this week we are reading Romans 10 through 1 Corinthians 16. Last week in reading Romans 1 through 9, Paul clearly communicates the gospel. And as we continue in Romans, Paul gives further guidance in what salvation means for the believer and how to live out of the salvation. Romans 10, 9 through 13 states, If you shall confess with your mouth that the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with your heart man believes into righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that come upon him, call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So God never replaced Israel. God revealed himself to the world through the nation of Israel. God's salvation story started in Genesis with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this story didn't end with Jesus. It continued. It was always God's intention to reconcile not just Israel through the Messiah, but all people. Paul explains to the church in Rome that God has not forsaken Israel. He's not replaced Israel with the Gentile church. He has reconciled the world through Jesus. Romans 11, 11 through 15. I say then, have they, Israel, stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvin has, salvation has come into the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be riches to the world and the diminishing of them be riches to the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you, Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my own office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and may shall save some of them. For if the casting away of them be reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? God will fulfill his purpose to Israel. Israel has been blinded in part for our benefit, for the benefit of the Gentile church, but at the fullness of the Gentiles, Israel will no longer be blinded, and then all Israel shall be saved. Romans eleven twenty five 25 through 27 states, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. That is the rapture of the church. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it's written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I shall take away their sins. So how do we know the will of God? Israel missed their Messiah because he wasn't what they expected. You know, Israel is now blinded in part because they missed Jesus. And that was his intention. He came as that lamb. So Israel had expected, though, that he would come as a king the first time, that he would come as king and he would free them from Rome. But he came as a lamb. He came to die as a sacrifice that would reconcile the world to him. Romans 12, 1 through 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So to know the will of God, we must lay down our own will, our own expectations, and be transformed by reading God's word. That we're not leaning on our own understanding, but instead we're filled with his word so we see what his will is. 
And his will is that we would understand that we are part of the body of Christ. And so Paul continues in Romans 12, four through five, for as we have many members in one body, we all have this, we all have hands and fingers and toes and all members have not the same office. We being many are one body in Christ and every one members of one another. So we were saved into the body of Christ. And Paul goes on to make a case for how we are to live out of this identity in Christ. Romans 14, 7 through 8. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man die to himself. For whether we live, we live to the Lord. And whether we die, we die to the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. So our whole life is to be wrapped up in Jesus. At the end of Romans, Paul endorses trusted believers in the church of Rome, and he cautions against those who would cause division by twisting doctrine. But notice Paul encouraged unity, but not compromising the truth. So he encourages us to be one, but not if that means compromising the truth. The truth is the most important thing. Romans 16, 17 through 18. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them for they are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good works and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. So we have to know God's word. And when someone is preaching something or teaching something that is contrary to what the Bible states, we're supposed to mark and avoid them, that they deceive us by good works and fair speeches. So sometimes that what sounds good can be the most dangerous because it can just a little bit veer us off from God's at what God is actually saying. So that brings us to 1 Corinthians. Paul's letter to the church in Corinth has a different tone than his letter in Romans. In Romans, Paul's focus was teaching and laying the groundwork for understanding salvation. Remember, he was also introducing himself to the church in Rome. Paul founded the church in Corinth, and this first letter addresses problems that had already crept into the congregation, a divided church. Paul addresses divisions within the Corinthian church and urges them to be unified in their purpose and in their teaching. He emphasizes that their identity is in Jesus and not in human wisdom. The wisdom of God is seen in the cross of Christ, which may seem foolish to the world, but is the power of God unto salvation. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 19 states, For the preaching of the cross is to them that are that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. So the church in Corinth did not only deal with divisions, but also with immorality. So Paul reminds them that their bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit and encourages them to flee from sexual morality. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20, flee fornication. Every sin that a man does without the body, outside of the body, uh, but he that committeth fornication sins against his own body. What? Know you that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So Paul challenged the church about their divisions and about their sexual morality, that it wouldn't just affect them, but it would also influence the lost world around them. He gave them practical advice on civil matters in relationships on how to avoid causing others to stumble in their faith. And it all focused on representing and honoring Jesus above everything else. And so 1 Corinthians 9, 22, to the weak became I weak that I might gain the weak. And I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake. And so we want to make sure that we don't cause other people to stumble. And so we have to be very careful 
with what we do and the way we present Jesus to other people. So starting in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul goes into detail explaining how the church is the body of Christ and each believer has their own unique purpose or gift, but together we make up the body. So there are different gifts, but all gifts come from the Holy Spirit and all are for the unified purpose of building up the body of Christ. After highlighting the importance of the unity in the body, Paul returns to the central focus of the gospel and our identity in Jesus. Some at the time were questioning the resurrection and he affirmed the resurrection, highlighting its centrality to the Christian faith. Paul explains the implications of Christ's resurrection, assuring believers of their own resurrection and eternal life. And so 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 54 states, now say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That means your body is not going into heaven as it is now. Flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That means not everyone will die, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And so right here, Paul is talking about the rapture. He's saying that not everyone will sleep. That means not everyone will die, but that everyone that has received Jesus as their savior will be changed. Right now, we are in a corruptible state. One day we will shed the corruptible and we will put on incorruption. And that incorruption is what goes into heaven. So 1 Corinthians was a guide to the church in Corinth and to the church throughout the ages. It provides practical teachings and insights into the challenges faced by the church throughout the years, emphasizing the importance of unity, the wisdom of God, love, holiness, and the hope found in the resurrection of Jesus. Through this letter, Paul encourages believers to live out their faith in a manner that glorifies God and builds up the body of Christ. So this month, this second month, we are focusing on the church. So the second month of the 90 Days to Transformation Bible Reading Plan, we are focusing on the church and the foundational letters from the Apostle to the Gentiles, Paul. Reading through the history and letters of the early church will help you to see how similar we still are today. This timeless instruction from God will encourage you and guide you as it did the early audience nearly 2,000 years ago. Also, forming the discipline of reading the Bible daily for 90 days will help you to continue this commitment. Just as we need to eat food and drink water daily to remain healthy, we must take in God's word, the bread of life, daily to remain spiritually healthy. Thank you.